Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. I see you all trickling in now. Uh, you guys that are waiting in, in the wings uh, are my favorites. The guys who show up and are on time and ready, uh, you guys are the ones who are always asking all the best questions. So keep it up. I'm going to just kill some time, keep on talking until we get people in here. Uh, in the meantime, as we're trickling in, go to the chat down at the bottom of your screen. Let us know where you're joining from, uh, your role, your name. Uh, it's always fun when we keep this like super interactive. So hop in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Killing time, killing time. You're still trickling in. 51 people so far. We had like 500 joins. So uh, it's going to be a fantastic conversation. We brought in some fantastic panelists that we're going to get to in just a sec. Uh, in the meantime, chat, go to the chat. Let us know where you're joining from. Uh, my name's Alex. I'm with Sales Hacker. I run the webinar program. I also work with our partners like Bombora and Snowflake. Uh, thank you, Bombora, for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, still just killing time until we get more people in here before we kick it off. Greg, welcome, Greg, from Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, I just moved from South Carolina, actually. I was on the East Coast over there for about three months. So I love that area. Uh, super nice weather. Nicola, welcome. Timothy from Verifor, welcome. Ed Carroll from Philly, welcome, welcome. Adam Reisinger, Quality Training Systems in downtown Chicago. John Glass, welcome in. Holly, Andrew, okay, okay. We're getting some good, good engagement. 70 people now with us. I say we, we kick it off, what do you guys think? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, some housekeeping items first. You guys are already saying hello in chat, good job. Uh, I want to make sure that we get a hold of all of your questions. If you ask your questions in the chat, we're going to lose track of them because as you can see, it scrolls by super quickly. There's a separate box at the bottom of your screen. If you open that up, ask your questions in there. I can go on the back end and like tick them off as we go. Okay. So like I said, we try to keep these like super conversational. We have three experts from three different tech companies. We're going to be talking everything in tents, how they operate. Oh my God, guys, we had this pre webinar and I forgot how to say, operationalize and before the webinar I practiced like five or six times to make sure I got it so three different experts three different tech companies they all operationalize intent in slightly different ways and we're really gonna like dive in today and get a really good view of what that looks like uh, and so you're probably gonna have a bunch of questions use the Q&A box not the chat and we'll make sure to get to them okay uh, inevitably we get like 5 10 15 requests for the recording during the webinar uh, so I'm gonna to try to tackle that right now. We are recording this. We're gonna send it to everyone in your inbox within like an hour or two after the webinar. So don't worry about it. We'll include the slides too. You're gonna to be taken care of. Uh, you don't even have to take notes. We, we handle it all for you. Uh, kicking it off. So our aforementioned three intent data experts, uh, starting with Kyle Coleman. He's currently the VP Revenue Growth and Enablement at Clary. Uh, really interesting position. Kyle, why don't you kind of let the audience know what you're doing now at Clary and also how you got started in sales, kind of your, your superhero origin story. Yeah, I'll start with the second question first because it's way more fun. I have been selling things my whole life. I, I think probably the most embarrassing one was, I think I was five or six years old and I thought it was gonna be a good idea to sell pine cones on the street in my neighborhood. And so I, you know, ran to a little copse of trees and I collected the pine cones I could get. And I had the, the makeshift stand and a cardboard looking all cute. I did the classic like $1 cross out 50 cents, cross out 25 cents to, to win the sympathy points. And I'll never forget a, a post office man, USPS, walked by and he had this pouch of change. And he just gave me the pouch of change and he took a couple pine cones. And I was like, Wow, that was really cool. And looking back, I know it was all out of just sympathy, uh, but it really made me feel good about what uh, what sales is and how you can delight people as a, as a as a as a prospect. And um, now, whenever I see kids doing or exhibiting the same sort of entrepreneurial spirit, I always try and patronize uh, what they're doing. So um, at Clary, I am the head of our growth team, which is a kind of a non-traditional coming together of marketing and sales teams, demand generation, field marketing, sales development, and sales enablement, all responsible for creating and accelerating revenue. And that's what our growth team is. Awesome, Ben. Where, where are you located, Kyle? I'm in Denver, Colorado. 
All right. Anyone has kids in Denver, Colorado, you know where to set up your kids' lemonade stand, right? That's right. Outside of Kyle's house. <laughs> I saw one selling dog biscuits recently, and they had their Venmo handle on the on the booth. And I was like, this is innovation. Gen I Zers, man. These I couldn't Zers, help. They're on top of it. That's right. <laughs> uh, Hillary, I'm going to... I'm going to kick it over to you. What is your superhero origin story? It's slightly different in that you're a director of ABM. You usually yeah, have salespeople on our webinars, but uh, I'm, it's really interesting to get your perspective on this. Uh, we'll dive a bit into your background later and like the, the questions we have prepared. But in the meantime, what is your, your superhero origin story? Yeah, so I lead the ABM team at Snowflake. I come from a background in education and advertising, done everything from PR and comms to demand gen, campaign management, tech management, all of the kind of stuff. I think ABM is the combination of all of those things where innovation and creativity collide. So that's kind of my sweet spot. Um, I started selling things when I was young. Also, Kyle, I sold eggs from our local chickens. So our family had chickens. My parents owned a business. They kept us busy during the day selling the eggs. But what stood out to me in those experiences was creating meaning meaningful engagements with the people in my community. And today that still stands. So in account-based marketing, we're creating meaningful, relevant, memorable experiences with the accounts that are high priority for the company. And that uh, is a place where we sit between sales and marketing. So I report into the marketing org, but we do align all the folks on my team to the sales teams and support them directly. That's awesome. I uh, did a little LinkedIn stalking prior to the webinar. And I noticed in your bio, you've scaled that one-to-one -one experience to over 2,000 accounts. I feel like we got to do a webinar on that, like on its own. So uh, I'm going to be in yeah. touch. I'm going to be in touch. The <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> uh, Matt, kicking it over to you. VP of sales and success at Bombora. Let's get that, that origin story. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, like these folks, I've been selling uh, since early days. I think first official sales job was uh, running the entrance department of the local car wash. I have sold variety of products and services uh, in B2C first, um, including Cutco knives, Kirby vacuum cleaners, cameras, uh, consulting services for hotels in Costa Rica, <laughs> uh, some estate planning and insurance, but it wasn't until about uh, 2007, I started my B2B career as an individual contributor with a company called Serious Decisions. And uh, I've had the fortune to grow through the ranks of sales and, and sales management um, under some incredible mentors since then. And, including this role currently is uh, VP of sales here at Bombora. So what that means is I oversee uh, our direct sales organization as well as our, um, our SDR team. And that is engaging with brands um, who are interested in leveraging intent data and helping them put that intent data to action. I, uh, I shared with some of these folks uh, a little hook that I'll share with you all. I'll often think of like, you know, what's the craziest thing you've done to, uh, to, to close a deal if you've been on the individual contributor side of the sales world and, um, I'll have to leave you with a cliffhanger, but mine is that uh, I once had to go to prison to close a uh, to close a deal. So if you want to hear more about that story, uh, feel free to follow up with me on LinkedIn after the, after the webinar today. We're going to have uh, Matt's LinkedIn info at the end of the webinar, so do follow up with him. I heard the I heard part of the story. It's pretty it's pretty good. Uh, awesome. I am excited to have all three of you here. Um, for those of you who are maybe just now joining, uh, say hello in the chat. A couple more call outs. Uh, Mark Cousin joining from Chicago, Eric Klecker from Texas, Stacy from New York City. Welcome, everybody. Uh, if you're just now joining, today we're talking about all things intent data, uh, specifically Clary, Snowflake, Bombora, how these three tech companies are operationalizing tech or intent data uh, and sales intel. Uh, and we're going to dive into that right now. So here's a quick agenda. Um, basically, how are all three of these revenue leaders using intent data to get a competitive edge over their competition, uh, how they're using it holistically to close deals, uh, how they're aligning sales and marketing. I think Hillary here is going to have some like really good insights and golden nuggets for everybody. So stay tuned. Uh, and then if you're like a revenue leader, you're brand new to intent data, it's overwhelming. You have no idea how to like integrate it into your workflows your, your, across your various teams. Uh, we're also going to cover some like really actionable next steps for you to like just get that first foot in front of the other and get going with intent data. Um, so kicking it off, I'm going to kick this over to you, Matt. Intent data has been around, specifically B2B intent data has been around for years. Uh, and on the consumer side, the B2C side has been around even longer, right? Uh, but many companies are still struggling to operationalize, operationalize it. Uh, can you give us like a very quick high level Intent Data 101. Thank you for all of us on the call who are like, have been living under a rock and aren't at all yeah, familiar with what it is. 
Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Just heard a uh, little bit of break up there. Looks like we're getting a, a little bit of lag, but I can still hear you okay. Yeah, I got you. Are you frozen? Can you hear us, Matt? Classic. He's frozen. God, Classic moved, Zoom calls. He moved to a new location for better Wi-Fi and everything. This is brutal. <laughs> oh, no. At least we got good lighting. Matt was describing prior to the call, he had this, like, jail-style, like, swinging lamp above his head. It looked <laughs> like he was, like, in witness protection or something. So we have a frozen Matt in good lighting on the beach. Um, I can hop in, Alex. Hillary, yeah, let's, let's, yeah. let's kick it over to you. Although, from my perspective, maybe when Matt comes back, he can add his uh, side as well. But... For intent data, the way I look at it and the way we look at it in Snowflake is we spend a lot of time deciding from an account-based perspective, who are we interested in? How do we score from a firmographic, technographic, who we're going to go after, who are our top accounts? And so that all indicates us being interested in them, but we look at intent as saying who might be interested in us before they even get to our website. So they're indicating that they might be entering a buying cycle, they're indicating they're starting to do research, and we can kind of pair those two pieces together and say, are they a fit for us? And are they entering into our market here shortly? And so that gives us a, you know, for a classic example, we're only hitting the tip of the iceberg and with intent, we can get to the whole bottom piece that we might not know is happening out there. It really allows our sales to get into accounts before um, needing to get the brand recognition of who we are. We can get there first. I couldn't agree more, Hillary. And, and that's very similar to how we use intent in at Clary as well is we're, maniacally focused on creating a really solid pre-sales prospect experience. And we're using intent data to help inform what that experience should be. Instead of just shoving down Clary messaging down their throats of what we think they should hear based on their persona or their industry or something like that, we see what they're interested in and what, what they need to learn. And we can shape our value props and shape our messaging accordingly so that there's as much res message resonance as possible. And we delight them with a pre-sales experience that matches what they're in the market for. Matt, you're back. Yeah, sorry, I, I sorry, love for, that. sorry for the cliffhanger there, folks. Thanks for, <laughs> for, for picking it up. I get, uh, I get kicked out. But um, yeah, I, I think you know our, our view of this um, intent data world, which is obviously very near and dear to our hearts, is it's really about helping to answer some of that age-old sales and marketing question, right, of who to reach out to and when and what to say, to do exactly what Hillary and Kyle have suggested, which is provide that initial experience that is relevant, that's on message, that's actually focused on the people that want to hear from you right now, right, versus um, some of the more traditional, I mean, many uh, of us, not necessarily us on this call, of course, but many in B2B have spent uh, years, if not decades, creating a lot of noise, right? Especially with the proliferation of, uh, of, of automation tools and ways to really um, batch and blast, for lack of a better term, to a you know, large swath of folks versus really focusing on some of those key informational nuggets and insights that allows us to understand who wants to hear from us right now, who's actively in, engaged in a buying cycle or a buyer's journey and educating themselves about our offerings and solutions. Um, so really excited about the conversation today. And again, sorry for the, uh, the, for the cliffhanger at the start there. <laughs> uh, that was an excellent description. I kind of want to recap what all three of you just said. So it sounds like you take your total addressable market, you identify your ICPs, you know, your ideal accounts within that market, and then you're using tint data on top of that as like a filter for deciding for informing who is most close to purchase and also even if they aren't close to purchase what they're interested in right it almost sounds like what marketers have been doing for years except like on steroids right like figuring out based on what you've been doing say on a website or off your website um to then inform kind of what content we're then going to feed you to nurture you uh along their their, their purchase journey does that sound about right I think there's an additional element. So there's the account-based perspective where you have your set accounts, then who's surging within those accounts to hit now timing wise. But then for a lot of companies, I've done this in, in times past, uh, you might have your addressable market, but then there might be other accounts surging that weren't on your radar and that can help you get into those accounts that maybe you weren't even paying attention to. So there's two sides of it from my perspective. Interesting. And when you say surging, it's literally just like people who are showing activity and whatever variables you've identified to be related to like uh, purchase activity, right? Yeah, I think Matt can probably answer that the best since that's the Bombora term, but okay. an abnormal spike in activity that indicates interest in a buying cycle. 
Gotcha. Yeah, that's right. We're, we're monitoring millions of companies to understand what their normal consumption behavior looks like on specific topics. Um, you know, so could be things like uh, cloud data, secure data sharing, forecast accuracy, sales engagement platforms, intent, et cetera, right? And while normal behaviors may be interesting, um, we don't believe it's all that actionable. So when we see a significant increase, as Hillary was indicating, a significant increase in their consumption of these topics or content that contains these topics, um, that's where we believe it really becomes actionable, right? And it may not necessarily indicate that they're in market and gonna buy something today, but it certainly is indicative that they're in some sort of an education um, process. And you know, our belief is that as sales and marketing leaders, we want our teams to be supporting um, that process and, and controlling the narrative before you know, our competitors are, are there doing the same thing. I mean, that's a huge competitive advantage, right? Getting involved earlier in the buying cycle is, is massive. You know, if, if you can get involved when they're still like uh, problem unaware, like that's, that's huge. If you can help like form that solution of what the solution might look like when they're still figuring out what the problem is, uh, you're gonna have a massive, massive edge over the competition. Uh, very interesting. Um, Matt, let's get a little tactical at Bombora. I'm assuming you guys are uh, taking a bit of your own medicine, right? You're using intent data at Bombora. Can you give us some like examples? I think we just covered the use case of account prioritization. What other ways are you using intent data at Bombora right now? Yeah, we've, um, I mean, we've leveraged the intent data from a perspective of understanding some trends in the market. Um, so looking at certain segments, um, you know, high tech, financial services, healthcare, understanding what companies um, that are in those industries or segments are most interested in. Um, we've actually produced and been, and been posting some really interesting studies around the change in online research behavior during COVID and work from home environments. Um, we can certainly, I'm happy to share some, some uh, article links to any of that. Just understanding what are the trends in research behavior in general. Um, we're also, you know, at the very beginning of this sort of journey for me, um, uh, airing a little laundry here, you know, we had very limited number of accounts in our, in our Salesforce instance, right? And so we set about trying to determine, okay, how should we augment and grow this, this base so that we have, um, you know, the right accounts to be marketing and selling to. And we, we did that with looking at this TAM exercise, right? It's understanding what are the companies that we believe um, represent a, a good ICP or the you know, customer profile fit for us. And then also running lists against our database to understand who was demonstrating company surge on topics like account-based marketing, demand generation, intent data, intent monitoring, Bombora, you know, you, you name it. Um, and that really helped us to kind of round out, okay, not only as, as I think Hillary was saying, not only are there the usual cast of characters that we know in B2B uh, are likely suspects, but let's also focus on perhaps what might be smaller companies than we thought were a great fit or uh, companies in other industries and really understand what's the, the broader universe to, to go after. Very interesting. So you're actually like expanding your TAM a bit with intent data. That's, yeah. that's very interesting. We actually have a very relevant question that just came through. So I'm gonna ask it, I think I'll, well, I'll, I won't direct this at any one of you, just if any of you have any thoughts on this, it's a really good question from Matthew Smith. Uh, what is the best approach for reaching out to accounts with high intent scores? So if you take one of those accounts that's surging, how do you actually operationalize that uh, specifically via like cold outreach? So if you have like a, in a business development team, how do you take that information? They're, they're trying not to be creepy, he mentioned. He doesn't want to just like the personalization. He doesn't want it to be like, hey, your account is surging. We saw that you're researching X, Y, and Z and uh, your stepsister's name is Sally. Like, um, any thoughts or best practices? Yeah, the, I don't think you necessarily ever need to mention that you know what they're searching for because you, you don't know if it's that person that's searching, like that's still anonymized. You know that the account may be searching for these things, but you don't know that it's the person. And so uh, unless they've come to you, your site and they're cookied and they're doing first party stuff, but um, assuming we're talking about the third party intent signals, the thing that's most important, sort of the secret sauce here is that your message needs to be aligned with what they're searching for, the keywords, the key phrases, whatever the, the bundle of things are that you and your team are tracking. You need to have outreach templates or sequences or snippets or whatever it is that track to those various keywords, specifically through the lens of what value you are bringing to that prospect and their persona for that keyword. So if you can find that intersection of persona 
and intent signal, that sweet spot is should be a value prop for, for every one of the keywords that you're tracking. And that is, there's no silver bullet, but that is the most reliable way to operationalize the intent data that you, that you see. Anything else to add, add there, Hillary, Matt? Yeah, at Snowflake, we, we do exactly that, Kyle, and then we kind of add on the next layer and we talk about bridging uh, sales and marketing. We've created kind of clusters of what are the topics surging in our different intent vendors and then mapping them to the different products or uh, portions of our product that we sell. And then we created the value add exactly like you're saying, but then we have our advertising side on the account-based marketing piece of the display ads, the ABM pages that they land on are built off of that same value that the SDRs are reaching out with. So we actually have um, on our side, we do a little bit of a delay. So we'll launch our display ads and our campaign and then 10 to 30 days later, depending on the, the account, the SDRs will reach out. So when that SDR reaches out, they've already seen the message around the web and it's warmer than it was before but again we never mention hey we saw that you were interested in this because that's creepy yeah i'm gonna agree and then also um deviate a little bit from those comments so i um we we take very similar approaches and while it's not a broader strategy or program that we're running there have been cases where the divulging um what we know about them has uh, has really quickly turned into engagement where it hadn't. Uh, we've been trying for for weeks or months to get engagement and, and, and not seen any. And that specifically is um, two cases: one where um, the reaching out cold to the right persona, um, having not gotten any any engagement or feedback, but then actually taking a screen grab of um, our uh, our package install with Salesforce, which shows the topics that a given account is demonstrating company surge on. And when it's been on things like Bombora and intent data and so on and so forth, or a bunch of our partners, we'll actually screen grab that. It's a very ABM, like one-to-one -one approach and embed that in the, um, in, the, uh, in the email. You know, basically not saying like, ha ha, I see you, but just acknowledging it looks as though you're showing a lot of interest. Um, and we actually had one of our uh, sales guys go really deep in a sales cycle, meet with complete silence, and then realized that that same company was beginning to demonstrate company surge on a couple of partners and competitors. And he put that back in the email and said, is it because you're looking at so-and-so, you know, and, and, and evaluating others? And they immediately resurfaced and were like, wow, yeah, okay, let's talk because clearly this is a, is a competitive advantage. It sounds like you're in a unique position to do that because it's highlighting the power of your own product, right? That's absolutely. You are Bombora. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, one way we kind of do something similar from the competitive side without being so direct is we've created snippets of use cases and customer stories that relate to a takeout of or a com competitor story of someone who had that product. And we'll use that in our outreach sequence to kind of touch on it so it resonates without pointing it out. So that's how we do it on the other side. Hillary, I'm going to kick it over to you again. I kind of want to double click. It, you mentioned this like really tight alignment between sales and marketing at Snowflake, where it almost sounds like you're running display ads as part of like an outreach sequence, like 10 days prior. That's, that's pretty sophisticated. That's pretty awesome. Um, I guess not everyone's going to be familiar with account based strategies or account based marketing. Would you mind giving us just like a super quick high level overview of why account based strategies are so popular right now and why they're blowing up? Like, what's, what's the big deal? Yeah, so we're an account based organization for the most part. So that's also very helpful. We have set lists of accounts that our sales reps go after and then our marketing teams are aligned to those. But when you think about it kind of from a funnel standpoint, instead of targeting everybody with a certain title or persona and then narrowing that down to who's a good fit, who's engaging, etc. You're starting with who is your ideal account and then building out a sphere of influence and engagement to then get into those, that account. So it's a different way to align your resources and your budget to really hone in on the accounts that uh, might have the largest impact. And we actually at Snowflake do account-based marketing all the way across the funnel from completely cold suspects to people with open opportunities and customers as well. So we'll touch all of them. Um, and the goal is different for each of the accounts, uh, depending on what the rep is looking for. Can, can anyone adopt an account-based approach or do you need like a certain like uh, contract value or sales cycle length? Um, it obviously works for yourself at Snowflake, but can anyone do it? Yeah, I think anybody can adopt an account-based approach. And I think it really goes back to sales how they were many years ago, where you have a specific set of accounts and you're doing personalized outreach, personalized um, 
tactics uh, to get into those accounts. So I'm curious, Kyle, what you think on the sales side about that? Yeah, it's an interesting sort of evolution, Hillary, because you're so right in you know the pre-Marketo, pre-sales law, pre-outreach days, doing outbound work was hard. <laughs> you couldn't just click a button and, and send 2000 emails. You had to, everything was one-to-one. -one, so everything was necessarily, if not account-based and certainly like prospect-based. I remember when I was in my SDR role back in 2012, 2013, I knew all of my prospects by name because I was sending them one email at a time via Gmail. And then we got into this world where accelerating that outreach was so easy that it became more of a numbers game at the top of the funnel as opposed to a quality game. And now technology has evolved so that we have so much more information available at our fingertips that it'd be silly to do the quantity-based, volume-based approach because we have so many more tools at our disposal. So we have to use those tools appropriately to help cull the herd and find the right accounts that are the right fit from an ICP standpoint, but also as, as Hillary and Matt have said, that we're getting them at the right time and we can, you know, maybe even before they know that they're in a market for a solution like ours, or maybe before they're aware of our solution as a startup, you know, that, that happens. And so we can get in front of them and, and force that to happen, accelerate that cycle. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, guys, I'm gonna give a quick recap of everything we covered so far, and then we're gonna run a quick poll just to get a better understanding of who's with us before we dive into kind of the second half of the webinar. Um, so, so far covered kind of what intent data is, uh, very high level, who can use it, maybe how powerful it is when combined with an account-based approach, account-based sales, account-based marketing. Um, essentially you take, you know, your ICP, you can layer on top intent data to prioritize which accounts are surging. Uh, that's a Bombora term. Uh, and then once you identify which accounts are surging, you can actually create relevant messaging using tech, using a sales enablement platform. So sorry, sorry, sales engagement platform like Outreach, like Sales Loft, um, based on the keywords that you've identified are surging. So they could be keywords around like certain problems that your product solves. Uh, if you know that specific keyword is surging, uh, you can have a sequence that then educates that prospect on how to solve that problem. Say uh, you could also have keywords around the solution that you solve or even the partners that you work with, uh, and then you can use one of these tech platforms, sales engagement platforms, to create sequences. Uh, or even as Hillary mentioned, if you want to go super sophisticated and probably do it the best way possible, align sales and marketing. Uh, so they're working together to nurture that prospect from the very top funnel all the way through to close one or close lost, right? Um, quick poll. So we want to get a better understanding of who's in the room. It'll kind of help us cater the next part of this discussion. So it's most relevant to everybody joining us here live today. Uh, you guys are the best. You guys don't wait for the recording. You guys show up live. We want to make this super valuable. So let us know which role best describes your own. Are you guys executives, SDRs? Are you in ops, enablement, leadership? Maybe we got some uh, demand gen or marketers in the room. So if I had a guess, and you know it's going to be a pretty good guess because I can see the uh, results in real time, but pretending I don't see that, I'm guessing we have a whole bunch of individual contributors in the room. Um, I'm guessing we have a lot of ops in the room as well, just because of the topic. It seems like a very topical to topic for uh, sales or marketing operations. Okay, I'm going to close this in uh, three, two, one. Look at that. Whole lot of SDRs, whole lot of account executives. We do have about 13% of the audience today is in ops. Got some sales managers, some leadership, and we even got a couple demand gen folks in here. Welcome. Um, okay. This is helpful. Uh, kind of. We kind of have a pretty broad spectrum. So it's not like we can just like dive in straight to like, okay, account executives, we're gonna show you how to integrate intent data into your workflow. Uh, but on that note, let's talk about workflows. Uh, from myself, I'm a complete newbie with intent data, right? I'm not all that familiar with how intent data actually fits within the workflow of like an SDR or an account executive. Um, can we walk through, let's, let's throw this over to Kyle, at Clary, if I'm say an account executive, where does intent data fit within my workflow? Like, do I see it in salesforce.com? How do I use it? Is it like my manager saying this account is surging on these keywords? 
Um, I'm assuming if you have like a sales engagement platform like Outreach, maybe it's all automated. Maybe it's just like we started the sequence because this account is searching on this keyword, but maybe not. Can you give me some clarity around there? Yeah, so we haven't gotten to that fully automated uh, sort of system as of yet. I'm not sure if we ever will. I'll actually be curious to hear from Hillary and Matt on this front. But the way that our reps are using Intent Data is all within Salesforce. With uh, We use Sixth Sense for our intent uh, solution for third-party anonymous intent signals. And on the account record in Salesforce, there's a tab for Sixth Sense. They click that tab and they see all the various things, the keywords that the company or the account is, is searching for, the location of who is searching, city and state, but not the actual person. And then what they do in strategy sessions with their AEs is they say, hey, we already know that this account was identified as a priority account for us. Let's look at some of the intent signals that we see here and we can create our messaging cadence based on the signals that we're seeing. So that's one way when the account is already identified. The other way is a means to prioritize accounts. And so we have Salesforce dashboards that show us all of the accounts that are in a buying or in market for a solution like Clary's based on the aggregated intent signals that are coming from the accounts. So if an account searches for enough of the right keywords, it gets bumped into what Sixth Sense calls a buying stage that says there's a very strong uh, possibility or likelihood of this account converting and turning into an opportunity. And so all of the accounts that are in a purchase stage or in a decision stage or something like that in the down, down funnel, six cents uh, funnel, we will basically our, our individual rev dev, we call revenue development at Clary, rev dev will go in and use those dashboards that we have in Salesforce to choose which accounts they should be reaching out to next once they get through all of the priority accounts that them and their AE are co-prospecting. Very interesting. So it's kind of a, a two-pronged approach. You are using it for like account prioritization uh, and you're also using it for sales intel. So you have an account that you're already working on. You can dive into their Salesforce uh, profile and just see, you know, the SDR, the account executive can walk through together. Like this account is particularly interested in XYZ problems or XYZ solutions or partners or whatever. Uh, it's just all sales intel. Um, very interesting. Hillary, exactly. Matt, do you have anything? Uh, additional to what Kyle just said um, that you guys are working on with Intent Data? Yeah, I can hop in. So it sounds like there's not a whole ton of marketers on the call, so I won't dive too far into the marketing side, other than when there's a large tens of thousands of accounts in a list that are unengaged and, and very cold, we'll use Intent to kind of categorize them and put them into a campaign that makes sense for that, that category, whether it be based off of um, workload in our case or product any, any category works in that situation. Um, we're also using it on the sales intelligence side to help drive um, finding new buying centers within existing very, very large accounts. So if you can map the topics that are surging to who would the kind of buyer and persona be for that topic, then within one large account as a different topic surges, you can identify, well, this is the topic, these are the people, then start d d digging into your data more and more of where is the location of that buying center. And you can just keep diving and diving and diving and kind of get to the bottom of these different um, groups within an account. So that's another way um, we can use it on the sales side. That's cool. That is cool. <laughs> Uh, we did have two marketers on the line, and I'm from a marketer background, so if for no one else but myself, I got to ask this question. Uh, it sounded like you're almost using Intent Data as like a, a contact enrichment tool for marketing purposes. Is that kind of right? Like I'm imagining in my mind, you have this giant database, right? Boom. You can layer on Intent Data on top of that database and then say, if I want to run a top of funnel like awareness campaign, just kind of highlighting some problems that we think these people are facing. I can upload that list into like Facebook custom audiences, create a custom audience and just serve ads to that group of contacts. Is that similar to what you're doing at Snowflake? I can speak to the Facebook side, but you can definitely create account segments. Um, and then Matt, you have to verify, but I believe there's also a feature where you can con you can target by devices. So while you don't know the actual person's name who is doing the activity, they can go to the device of the person doing the activity and really get uh, granular there as well. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. You can essentially take this whole universe concept of my TAM, who are the accounts that are demonstrating the most interest right now? And if your belief is I don't need to serve an ad to every person at that account, for example, you can layer in our cookie level intelligence, which is the device level to create those custom audiences or custom segments for things like programmatic advertising and digital display. 
Um, same is true for paid social with things like LinkedIn and Facebook, creating account segments where you specifically want to target those, only those accounts or target those accounts more heavily because you know that they're representing more interest. Yeah, you're spot on. Yeah. Uh, Alex, from the enrichment side, um, while I don't do it currently in a past life, we did what we call an IQL, an intent qualified lead, where he said any account that's serving at a very high threshold, um, we'd send to our ops team. The ops team would pull in all contacts from Zoom Info and other providers that uh, mapped that account. And then we'd actually surface them in Salesforce as a lead of source with an SLA of when to follow up. And it was, uh, while I won't share numeric uh, feedback from it, we uh, arrived to our desk with a whiteboard from the SDRs that said Bumbora is the bomb uh, because it was helping them uh, have a lot more fruit out of their labor from the time they were spending reaching out to accounts. Got it. And so it's less, it's less you have a database with all this contact information and you're layering on intent data. What you just described with the IQL is you're, you have an account, if they're surging, you then work with a data provider like Zoom Info and find contact information for the different personas within that account. Post yeah, it's a combination of both. And I think the great okay. thing about intent data in Bombora specifically the way they provide it, you're not locked into how to use it. So it's really just this intelligence that you can go map and pair with anybody or anything that you want to use it for and with. I think some of the reps on the call might be just having a reaction, like a visceral reaction to another marketing acronym. But I promise this one is useful. The intent qualified lead. I really like that concept, Hillary. That's super smart. Yeah, it works really well. Matt, I'm going to kick this over yeah, to you. I, I'd add one, one quick. Yeah, please. Yeah, go for it. No, the floor is yours. I, I was just going to say there's, in our, in our world, with our reps, we've got named accounts and non-named to, to oversimplify a little bit, right? The named accounts, those reps, they go into their Salesforce homepage and we've created a button that says my serving accounts. So every week they click that button, they see a list prioritized by, by, the, by the strength of the company surge signal on those accounts and they know where to prioritize. On the other side, for the non-name, we round robin all of those through the SDRs um, and they are keyed up by um, some traditional lead scoring, you know, hand raisers, been to my website, downloaded this white paper, blah, 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 blah. But also, um, is that company demonstrating company surge? So kind of the IQL concept, right? And if so, assigning additional lead uh, points in the lead scoring model, it may trigger them into direct follow-up from the outbound SDR team. And then the other side of all of that is actually running all of this through um, outreach sequences where um, we were seeing um, tasks, right? So every time a company demonstrates company surge to a certain level, the rep who owns that account will see a task surfaced in outreach and they know to push them right into a sequence that we've already worked with marketing to design so that they can put that right into workflow. And it's been super powerful, you know, for us on an internal use case of, of all these um, uh, insights and, and platforms. It's very interesting. That sounds very powerful. Um, you kind of touched on it there, Matt, this, this combination of first party and third party data and how that can be really powerful where you're combining, you know, they're both, in, it's both intent, right? Um, someone lands on your website, downloads a white paper on how to solve a particular issue that signifies intent. And you're kind of combining that with Bombora's intent data, which would be third party. Um, most people, except for maybe the marketers and the ops, uh, folks on the line are going to have no idea what I'm talking about when I say first party and third party data. Would you mind giving us like a really quick overview of what both of those things are? Yeah, I mean, simplest definition, I think, you know, first party is they come to your website, they're engaging with your assets. If it's marketing's creative landing pages or registration forms or articles, uh, or they're on your product pages, for example. Um, and that can be really insightful, of course. That's a, that's a direct engagement with that organization. Um, and when married with, and they're also demonstrating company surge across the broader web, it's a really powerful combination to, to identify, you know, strength of their intent to purchase. The other side of that equation is uh, if they are sh showing company surge across the broader web and not visiting your site, not engaging with you directly, here's an opportunity to drive some inbound marketing programs that can pull them into that direct engagement. Um, and, and that's where things, and, and Hillary's probably better to speak to stuff like this, but that's where, you know, workflows like um, engage, using uh, platforms like Engageo to understand the level of engagement directly with those organizations can really play uh, as a pretty powerful tool in combo. Yeah, for the AEs on the call, the conversations I like to have with my reps is 
uh, reps live to see those engagements and engage you in the different engagement tools to see what have they been doing, what have they been researching, what page have they been, what campaigns are they responding to. But as a marketer, um, it's my job to help get people to those engagements. And so intent helps us bridge that gap between the activities happening, happening outside of our domain and then getting them to engage with our domain by targeting them with the messaging that we believe is relevant based off of their searches. That gets me super excited. Again, coming from a marketing background of like having this ability to take this group of customers who currently isn't engaging with you like on your sites or with your assets online uh, and still being able to identify them and then throw them into very targeted campaigns to get them to try to engage with you. Uh, that's super powerful. It sounds like that's something that previously would have been impossible maybe uh, without intent data. Like that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty unbelievable. Um, okay, guys, we are, we still have a few questions kind of prepped up, but frankly, we've covered like a lot here. I feel like each one of these like subtopics could have been a webinar like in and of itself. Um, audience, ask your questions right now is your opportunity. You have like unfettered access to three revenue leaders at three different tech companies to talk about anything intent data or sales intel, operate, operate, what's a different word for operationalizing? I think I have to remove that one from your vocabulary. <laughs> how, to, how to operationalize really any of this stuff. If you have any questions, open up that Q&A box, ask him right now. Uh, it's really fun if we can use this last like 10 or 15 minutes as kind of like a rapid fire Q&A. Um, and right now is your chance. So ask anything you want down in the Q&A box. Uh, otherwise, I'll give you guys a few minutes. I'll keep rambling here. Uh, as those questions are rolling in, I guess I'll kick this here we go. Here's one from Maxwell Comparetto. What are the mandates around or reasons for data being de-identified? This one's for you, Matt. Um, I, I guess I would need a clarification against the question there. I'm not, I'm not sure if I follow the de-identified piece. Hey, Max, uh, throw, give us a little more intent data. What are the mandates around or reasons for data intent data being de-identified. Is that ringing any bells? Max, let's get, let's get some more details, Max. In the meantime, we got another one from Anonymous, doesn't want to be identified. Uh, have you measured conversion rates with intent data? Like as if, you know, you take conversion rates across your sales cycle, whatever, let's just say close one, just pick one. Uh, have you done analysis to see if those leads that have a higher intent score are closing at a greater rate than those without an intent score? I am very happy that this question was asked because it's super important. Like you can have all the best programs in the world and you can be operationalizing your intent data till the cows come home. But if the pipeline isn't created and if it's not moving through the opportunity life cycle, then you, you've wasted a lot of effort. I need to go back to the drawing board. So having a means of measuring that is super important. And I alluded to it before, but the way that we think about things at a very high level is through those six cents buying stages. So are those accounts, when the, when the opportunity was created, was it in one of those buying stages, consideration, decision, or purchase? And if so, does that pipeline behave differently than pipeline that was not in, or an account that was not in one of those buying stages? And what we've seen is that not only is intent data predictive of an opportunity being created, but having those strong intent signals is also, uh, it correlates very strongly to an opportunity moving from what we call stage zero, the SDR created stage into stage one, the sales qualified stage, as well as from stage one to closed one. And so having a means of measuring that based on account level information is super useful for us to gauge the efficacy of this intent data and the usefulness of it. That was an amazing answer. So it sounds like make sure you're, you're measuring it, make sure you test it for yourself, just like anything else, any other tool you would use, make sure it's working for you. Exactly. And Alex, we were supposed to say you can use Clary to do all that measurement. So that way I didn't have to say it, but we'll work on that okay, uh, yeah. in, future, in future webinars. We'll get our flow going. Don't worry. <laughs> we've, got, uh, we've got some more um, context from Maxwell as well that just came through uh, from Max. Why is it that it's only provided maintained at the account level as opposed to the individual lead or contact? Um, so for, for in our world, it's a really simple answer. And that is um, for GDPR and privacy compliance reasons on one end, and you know, we'd love to say we were so 
um, inventive and so far ahead of our time that we knew all of these regulations would be coming in the way they are. The reality is um, our core belief is that it isn't about the one individual consuming that, it, that, that one piece of content, but instead it's the aggregate behavior of the account compared to how that, then the, the unique number of users from that account, how much content they normally consume and how much of an increase in content is being consumed that's most actionable for folks like us um, to really do that prioritization. I would imagine too, and you guys tell me, you're the experts, but I would imagine if you're doing this whole sales thing correctly, uh, you'd have your ICPs identified, right? So if an account's surging, you would already know like the, stake, the typical stakeholders within a deal. Um, there's not necessarily much extra value in identifying particular like leads within an account, right? Yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you, Max, for providing a little more context there. We ha have an interesting question from Linda Mullins in the chat. Uh, a little context on her situation. She has a finite number of target prospect accounts, only about 200, so pretty, pretty small. Um, they currently use Salesforce, but minimally. Uh, we mentioned a few tools, uh, sales engagement tools, data providers uh, that work well in combination with Intent Data. If they don't have any of those today, what one platform or solution would you recommend they get started with to help them make the most of their Intent Data investment? Yeah, I think this dovetails actually with um, Christoph, uh, another question in the Q&A, which is sort of, you know, we're, we're just getting started on our data-driven marketing and sales strategy. Um, you know, does BB, I'm guessing Bambora also work for companies with lower marketing maturity? So the, the answer is um, to both, I think, is, uh, is that for us, our platform, our user interface allows you to go in and run these reports. And the output is, uh, is spreadsheets, right? Is, a, is an ability to just rank order all of the accounts that you've run the reporting against based on the topics that you're interested in tracking and being able to see an output that, you know, is very tactical um, in use. And, and we have customers who are, you know, 50 person companies who will run that report and disseminate those uh, top surging accounts to their, to their sales or BDRs. Um, you know, and then typically um, sales prioritization uh, when folks begin doing things with LinkedIn, that's a really quick time to value. Uh, but it's really, you know, accessing the insight for most is most important. And then building and scaling their tech stack and their, their maturity of their programs and approaches to go to market alongside that. Um, it, it depends on the use case, but, but you, could, you could drive all of this insight directly from, um, from the user interface. Um, there are other tools where, you know, I don't know if we, we talked about if you would include an outreach or someone like that in that, in that tool set or an Engageo, um, but certainly those tend to be uh, tools that folks are engaging with earlier on in their maturity uh, in terms of their tech stack. So we do see quite a few folks that are much smaller organizations leveraging those types of tools first. Awesome. So you can stay pretty lean. You don't need some giant tech stack to take advantage of intent data. That's right. Yeah, I don't know if we did ourselves the greatest favors in the world. We originally were focused very heavily on enterprise and we did a, a fairly good job there. But I think a lot of people look at our, our client base of the, the IBMs and AT&Ts and, and you know, Salesforce of the world and go, wow, this is, this is too big and mature and, and bulky for me to deal with. And it's uh, a misconception that we're, we're actively educating them. About. Got a small team. Check out Bombora. Um, okay, we have a bunch of questions now. I think I... Uh, open Pandora's box here. Let's kick it off with Anonymous. Uh, what we've done is created our buyer personas, developed a HubSpot sequence, and enrolled relevant personas depending on the topic being searched. So it sounds like they're using keywords, uh, and then they're similar to the process that we've already outlined, throwing those guys into our particular like sales sequence depending on or based on whatever keywords have been searching. Um, I lost track of the question. Is there anything else that you can recommend that they do in addition to that uh, to make the best use of the intent data that they're buying? You can throw direct mail into the mix um, based off that as well. If you want to the same topic, cut through the clutter, especially right now when folks are inundated with digital elements. I like that, direct mail. So you can get creative. Like you don't have to just do like the traditional, uh, anything you can do in a regular sales sequence, you can get creative, add in social, add in direct mail, obviously phone, email, um, in-person visits. 
the, there's a nice one-two punch that you can have, of course, for this is, it's not scalable to all accounts, but for your highest value accounts, the marketing team can kind of serve as air cover, serving digital ads that are in response to those intent signals that come in. So for us, if we see people that are interested in uh, forecast accuracy, then we're going to serve them digital ads on LinkedIn that are about forecast accuracy. And then, so that's kind of the marketing air cover. And then we have the ground troops in the SDR and AE teams that are going in and basically doing exactly what uh, Anonymous outlined here and, and creating those persona based uh, sorts of sequences that are in alignment with the intent signals that they see. And that way we kind of get them from both, both sides, create awareness within the account about what we do, solving the problem that they're interested in, but also being, you know, in their, in their face about it and, and trying to, you know, get immediate responses from them. I love it. So that's a really good example of taking a more like top of full funnel approach, right? You're at the top of the funnel, the middle of the funnel and the bottom of the funnel. Uh, let's focus in on the bottom of the funnel here. We got a question from anonymous again. Can you or do you use intent data to drive urgency? So say you, you know, you're well within the sales cycle already. They're maybe evaluating vendors, uh, but they're stalling, right? Um, can you drive urgency with intent data? Is that something that you guys have seen done or do yourselves? Matt, have you seen that done? Um, yeah, we've seen in some cases maybe maybe less urgency around you know close of the month or close of the quarter, but. Um, certainly from a conquest campaign perspective, again, leveraging one thing we, we didn't drill into too deeply, but one set of topic types in our world is company names, right? So um, if you begin to see one of your prospects uh, demonstrating company surge on a set of competitors, um, that would be indicative of an opportunity to perhaps go in and offer some sort of a, a discount or some sort of value add uh, in, in that sales cycle to kind of keep things, uh, keep you engaged directly. That plays out actually really well. I don't know of all of the um, account executives or, or sales folks on the line, individual contributors, how many are account managers, um, but that's another um, really popular use case. Running the list of the accounts that are already my customer and understanding their behavior around company surge. Because if they're researching topics related to what they, um, what they already buy from me and competitors, it's you know almost a canary in the mine shaft kind of scenario. I may have a churn mitigation issue on my hands. If they're if they're demonstrating high level of company surge um, on topics related to offerings that they don't currently buy for me, I may have a cross sell up sell opportunity in my hands. And both of those um, can can help drive some urgency. Hey, it looks as though you're also interested in, and now maybe we can take a solution and value add approach to that sales cycle. Cool. That is cool. I love that. Thank you. Um, interesting question from Dustin Cherry here. This is not necessarily around intent data, although feel free to loop that into the answer. I'm going to throw this one at you, Kyle. Uh, if you were placed into a new company and had to build a prospect list from a company's current database at a high level, what would be your analytical approach? How would you start? ICP. I mean, you, you have to start with what, what you think are the most likely fits based on what your, or the company's definition of its ideal customer profile is. And so the easiest way to do that, and actually I did this when I started at Clary back in April of last year, is just looked at the logo wall and tried to, you know, do some spreadsheet analysis about the industries that those companies were in, the size, how many sales employees they had, what their tech stack was, you know, the, the basic kind of uh, technographic, firmographic type things that you can uh, use Zoom Info or Sales Navigator and, and just like make that a more manageable set of companies to to reach out to. Um, so this is kind of the, the old school intent signals of this is probably a, a good fit based on what we do from a product market standpoint. Um, so that's where I would start. And if you want to loop intent into that, Matt, I don't think you mentioned this. Um, I think there's a huge value in the historical analysis and that's a service that has been so, so valuable to us where you can take those who have become customers, what intent topics are they surging on 18 months, 12 months, six months, four months before they actually made a purchase. So you can actually identify them. We found topics that were not in our list at all that we weren't even paying attention to that were like, whoa, they're actually surging on this thing. And then six months later, they're surging on this thing and you can actually get to them way earlier than um, even we realize. Yeah, it's a great point. It's something we do for, um, for a lot of our clients is, is help them with that sort of buyer's journey analysis, right? The companies that have purchased from you, what did their research behavior look like leading up to that purchase? 
Um, and and a, one prime example, we worked with a company um, in the cloud security space who had who indicated to us that they were intentionally ignoring um, cyber warfare as a topic because they believed that meant that that would be more like state and government entities doing research, right? And that wasn't their ICP. Turned out that for two entire quarter periods in that 18 month journey, cyber warfare was one of the top five company surging topics from the people who bought from them. And wow. they had intentionally ignoring that signal all along. So it's really, um, really can be quite interesting when you get down into the insights level of data. Yeah. That's an amazing answer. Okay, Dustin, so just to recap, uh, define your ICP, take your, your total current customer database, find your best customers. And the way to do that is, it sounds like historical analysis of technographic, firmographic characteristics. So whatever, take your best customers, the ones that are easiest to work with, highest lifetime value, lowest CAC, however you want to define that. Look at all these variables. You can layer in intent data, like Matt just described, uh, what topics historically or keywords have been surging uh, prior to those best customers purchasing. Uh, and then build out a profile, an ideal customer profile, and then go find more people like that. And that should be your prospect database. Um, okay, we have three minutes left, guys. Enough time for one more question. Uh, Matt, this one's directed at you. It's from Greg. Matt, please talk more about Bombora score threshold. And when should I feel really confident? 70, 80, 90? Uh, I, I'm assuming feel confident in terms of like, when should I take action on it? So first let's cover the second half of the question, but let's cover that first. Yeah, I think we can actually get these last two from Anonymous and Greg all in one. Okay. Uh, the way we measure the intensity of the signal is against a baseline of normal. So on a zero to 100 scale, 40 to 60 scores are normal behavior in the algorithm. When we see a score and you see that he, um, Greg is asking 70, 80, 90, indicating some knowledge of this scoring system, we see a score reach 60 or above. That means there's more unique users from that company consuming more content of higher relevancy than they normally do on that topic or topics, most importantly, which is the second part of the answer here. Um, anything above a 60 is, an, is, a, is, an, is an, a company surge. The higher, this, the higher the score, the stronger this, the signal on that particular topic. I'd encourage people to think about it slightly differently. Look at the number, the total number of topics on which a company is demonstrating company surge as the strongest indicator of intent versus the individual topic score. So then looking at, here's a list of my thousand companies. Here are all the companies that are showing company surge on you know, 10 out of the 25 topics that I'm monitoring. Prioritize them over the companies showing company surge on two out of the 25 as an example. Excellent. Hillary and Kyle, they, there was a, T up there for you as well on, on how, if and how you're doing that, I think. I, I can answer it really quickly. Um, in terms of making a move on the data, I, for me, it comes down to volume and capacity. So if you don't have very many resources or time to be using intent data, I would go after the highest numbers you can. And then I'm in a situation right now where we're doing something where we want to kind of get the feeling for what we've got. So we've got a lower threshold. We're in the um, high 60s, low 70s. We can see how many accounts come in. And then if it's more than we can handle, we'll start pushing the score up to narrow in the list. It's like the aperture of a camera lens, right? You can, you can broaden it or, or focus it as much as you like, depending on the program and, and the bandwidth. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys. Uh, that takes us to the top of the hour. So got to wrap up the, our discussion today. I feel like that was a really holistic overview of intent data, right? How each one of you are operation using intent data. Uh, at each one of your companies. Um, I feel like we need more webinars on this, frankly. I feel like each one of these topics could have been an hour in and of itself. We could have gone super deep. Instead, we stayed pretty high level. Um, but frankly, I found that super valuable. And I'm assuming for people who showed up to this webinar uh, who were new with Intent Data, they probably took a lot of value from that as well. So thank you to all three of you. And thank you to everyone joining. Uh, you guys are awesome. Sales Hacker community always shows up ask the best questions, super engaged in chat. Um, so thank you all for joining. And thank you, Hillary, Kyle, and Matt for sharing your wisdom. You guys are like fountains of wisdom and that of knowledge. So appreciate y'all. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. Thanks for joining. Thanks for facilitating, Alex. Awesome, have a great one, everyone.